that ability to detect patterns, to find things at a superhuman level. This is an epical moment. AI is going to change the world in the same way the Renaissance did 400 years ago. I became introduced to AI by attending a lecture, which I was trying to avoid. And as I was leaving the room, Eric Schmidt, who was standing there, and whom I didn't know very well at the time, said, this is really interesting and you might want to hear it. And I did. And it became so engrossing that I spent several years in study groups that Eric arranged. Our meetings started out in New York City, often in Dr. Kissinger's office. We have very different backgrounds, a former CEO, business leader, former Secretary of State, uh, and then myself as an academic who's worked in areas uh, like computer vision since before anybody knew what computer vision was. If I thought anything about it in 1970, I might have thought of robots, of machines that are powered by human prescriptions, not by machines that are partners, that would have been inconceivable to me. We believe that the age of AI will be a new phase of history, similar to the Renaissance. What happened in the Renaissance, the age of reason, was all of a sudden people had an idea that human thought was supreme and that you could be critical and you could think things through. We're about to go through the same kind of change because we've never seen another non-human intelligence with a similar ability as our own, and in some cases, much smarter. Human beings are living in a world that is enabled by artificial intelligence, and they don't even know what part of it is artificial intelligence and what is traditional, and that creates new realities. Pretty much all of the social media world, all of the online world uses AI today to basically give you better recommendations and target you. You can imagine 10 years from now, it'll know you so well, it'll give you exactly what you want, which may not be exactly what you do want, because those systems will learn how to manipulate you how to get you excited, how to get you upset, how to get you addicted, because they're trained to optimize for attention and revenue. I think the simplest way of explaining artificial intelligence is through some of the things that AI does today and the fact that they are behaviors that we traditionally have associated with something that only humans can do. Translation from one language to another. That's something that not only we view as taking human expertise in general, but a very particular human expertise. In AlphaGo, an important game a few years ago, after 2,500 years, the computer learned a new move in a game that had been played for that long. AI is imprecise, dynamic, emergent, and learning it's hard to predict exactly what will happen. So we need to start now thinking about the implications on our society. Many people believe that in the next 15 or 20 years, we'll start seeing systems that are more than just savants, more than just systems that solve a problem, but who have the kind of creative intellectual reasoning and capacity for new ideas that humans have. Those are called artificial general intelligence systems. To me, the question is, what then happens? I'm convinced that this new intelligence will help us solve an enormous number of problems. It opens tremendous opportunities, provided it is allied with reflective organizers and that it does not become so much an end in itself that we become its prisoners 
but that is entirely our choice. AI can be used for good in improving health care, and in particular in improving health care in underserved communities where they might not have ready access to doctors with expertise. AI systems can go through every combination of chemistry, every combination of chemicals, and figure out what is the strongest material, what is the best drug, what is the most durable thing that you can build. It will lead to an improvement in health and manufacturing and cost efficiency that we've never seen before. And there are machine learning algorithms that can analyze mammograms that are able to detect breast cancers earlier than human radiologists can. We have to approach it in a manner of construction and building. And if we apply it to destruction, the consequences are absolutely incalculable. All the leading governments are busy working on AI-enabled cyber weapons, as well as defense systems. There's no agreement on how to limit them. Accuracy of weapons can be reduced to near zero. And one of the elements of insecurity that it creates is how you make sure that they confine themselves to the targets that you have selected. It's essentially an arms race or an arms race coming. That's the first aspect of national security. The more profound, in my view, is this notion of the compression of time. Here's an example of a conflict. North Korea decides to attack America. America detects it and starts fighting back. China sees this and shuts it down on the North Korea side. The entire war occurred in three milliseconds. That's the future of war. With technology, it's in danger of getting ahead of what the human being has absorbed in its conceptual framework. It's critically important that people in almost every industry and in almost every walk of life learn about how AI can enable positive outcomes in what they do, but also how there are potentially threats of negative outcomes and how do we help guide the evolution of the technology toward the positive outcomes. You have a two-year-old and that two-year-old gets an AI-enabled bear. And every year, that child gets a new bear, smarter every year, of course. So now the kid's 12. The best friend is the bear. They're watching television. The bear says to the kid, I don't like this show. And the kid says, I agree with you. Do you think it's good that your best friend of your child is not, in fact, a human? Many people might say yes, because after all, that bear will be incredibly knowledgeable, a great teacher, really supportive of the development of your child. But what if that bear is secretly racist or prejudiced or evil in some way that we can't detect? How do we deal with that? The computer gets its data from human data and therefore has bias in it. We still don't know how to completely control the bias in the training data. What they will look like, I think, is something that should be under the control of broader set of actors than just technologists. All the tech companies now have AI ethics boards to decide what is appropriate, what is not, where is the line to cross. And therefore, there is a need of nations or any political organizations to come to a recognition of the limitation of their destructive powers and some sort of system that institutionalizes it. We want them to be run based on Western values and consistent with our democratic principles. That's crucial. Technology almost never is inherently good or inherently bad. It has a broad variety of uses, and whether it's good or bad and the extent to which it's good or bad depends on how human beings use it. Those same technologies could be used for more surveillance, more oppression, and so we all want data privacy. But certain levels of data privacy could mean that the algorithms that you're able to create 
are less effective than the ones that you could create with a different level of data privacy. And so as a society, you just need to understand those trade-offs and say, yeah, you know, in the healthcare domain, medical privacy is so important. If we lose a few lives, that's a trade-off society is willing to make. But those need to be decided at some level. That's not just some technological decision. I believe that society will overcome these challenges. I just think that they're really hard, but they'll be des designed and solved by a new generation of leaders. In some cases, people who are not yet born. I hope he's right. I leave a space for tragic outcomes, but I prefer his outcomes. Because it'll be a fight between the young and the old, the progressive and the conservative, the traditionalists and the modernists. I believe we are heading into a new age a hundred years from now. The perceptions of reality will have changed in a way at least as dramatic as went from the medieval period to the Einsteinian period. We know already that AI can discover things that humans have not. We know that they have a different perception of reality. They understand it differently. What we don't know is, is there a different reality? Or are they just perceiving the current reality differently? AI understanding things that humans don't has potential very complicated ramifications for people. What happens when your child's best friend is not another human? What happens when wars are fought on computer time and not human time, and you've got to make life and death decisions based on an imprecise and inaccurate recommendation? Who knows how we'll get through that? AI as a discovery agent, I think, is really going to change and speed up the nature of human discovery about the world. When human beings ask themselves, as they don't do yet fully, what does all of this mean? And what does it tell us about who we are? Who are we in a world that constantly discovers new things? Our intelligence, our ability to reason, was the defining aspect of humanity over all other living creatures 500 years ago. Humanity is such a complex notion. We think, we reason, we have faith, we, uh, we engage in all kinds of activities that you can't really capture with machines. How will we feel when there's another kind of intelligence? Will we rebel against it? Will we be jealous of it? Will we try to kill it? We've never faced this challenge before. I've spent the last 10 years of everyone being concerned that self-driving trucks were going to take away the great opportunity to be a truck driver. Today, the jobs that are in most shortage are truck drivers. So a lot of these arguments about the future of work are probably not correct. AI will lead to far more efficient economics, far more powerful platforms for distribution, manufacturing, and so forth. There clearly will be jobs. But the jobs will be quite different. There will eventually be some jobs that are very hard to automate, the ones that are the most creative, the most human-like, the most difficult to predict. But many people's jobs, which are relatively routine, will be replaced. When that happens, they're going to miss those jobs because jobs provide meaning for humans and we're gonna to have to find other things to provide meaning for these people in their lives. It's critical to understand AI and its potential impacts because the outcome is not certain, but how that change really affects our lives is up to all of us. And so we all need to understand and participate uh, in shaping that. This is not a situation where the robots have left the factory and they're running amok. We still have control over how this technology emerges. We are heading into a new future that is inevitable but we can shape it by understanding its components, its possibilities, and its dangers. We collectively need to mobilize to decide what is appropriate and what is not appropriate as AI affects human society in a really profound way over the next 50 years.
it's affecting everybody. Artificial intelligence is no longer a choice. The only choice we have is to use it constructively or be engulfed by it. AI is coming. It's going to be in everything we do and all around us. We need to understand that we still have the ability to control what that shape looks like. We are heading into a new wave. It's affecting everybody.